to the Bronx Hip Hop Oral History Project. Today is Wednesday, April 10th, 2024. I am Pastor Crespo Jr., the research librarian and archivist for the Bronx County Historical Society. Today I'm joined by Frank Rojas, also known as Papo. Frank is an actor, director, producer, writer, content creator, and rock dance extraordinaire. Papo is considered to be the first wave, first generation rock dancer, and an intricate part of the urban phenomenon that cultivated the rock dance scene. Bapo's Bronx-based uh, street-style dancing expertise has him traveling to both sides of the world, where he trains dancers and lectures about the original rock dance and its influence. Welcome, Frank. Thank you. It was, it was a little rough intro, so forgive me on no, that it's one. good. I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for joining us and to cutting out. I know you're real busy you know, and making time for us here today to record this testimonial on mm -hmm. the rock dance. We like to begin all our oral histories by asking our candidates, tell us about your family history and background. Where do your parents come from? Okay, well, first let me say I'm honored to be here. So you're not taking anything away from my time. This is a pleasure and I think it's important. Um, so my parents, came over from Puerto Rico. My, my dad was from San Juan, uh, Corozal to be exact, okay. and my mother was from Mayagüez, Rincón to be exact. So they were on separate, you know, uh, opposite ends of the island, right? right. Um, and, you know, when they were, I think, five, six years old, they came with their parents again for better, better quality of life, uh, moved into the barrio, and uh, I think that was in 19... It might have been 1940, it was the early 40s, you know, the 50s, um, yeah, and, and made a life for themselves here in the United States. You know, again, um, the idea is you come from Puerto Rico and, you know, you, you, you look to get Americanized, and, and, and that's what they did, you know, in spite of, you know, trying to hold on to the culture, the diaspora, even our humanity, you know, it was, it was still, you know, let's figure a way to fit in, you know, and, and, it, and it wasn't about inclusion. It was more about we're here, therefore we belong. So I think that's what they're always instilled in me. You, know, you, you belong. Got it. Got it. So did they meet in Puerto Rico? No, so, in no, no. They were kids when they came over. Um, my dad lived in Claremont Avenue in the Bronx. So did my mother. Um, my dad's parents, they owned a candy store. My dad was always in the candy store. My mother walked in one day, and as soon as he saw her, she, he told her, he said, you're going to be my wife. You know, it was love at first sight for him. For her, she thought he was nuts. But, yeah, it was love at first sight for him. My father is Afro-Latino. My mother is Rubia. So we had okay. both sides. We had black and we had white, you know, right. and brown in between. And that's the beauty of our culture, right? We're black, we're brown, and we're white. Nobody can mess with that. Exactly. Beautiful, beautiful story. So, uh, you know, did your parents actually speak about, I know they were young, but did they speak about what was on their parents' minds, you know, what they told them, why they came, you know? I know you said yeah, the American it was, it dream. Was just, yeah, the American dream, you know, seek a better life, um, you know, in terms of quality. You know, Puerto Rico was poor at the time. I guess there wasn't a lot of work. So, you know, my grandfather came here, got a job right away, worked for a mattress company, helped build that mattress company, although he never got the money they made from it, but he was still part of, you know, that whole you know, building. Um, my grandmother worked, um, she also worked in a mattress company, but she worked in the sewing, you know, she was, you know, as a, as a right. seamstress, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, just those those basic jobs that were available for them were, was better than what they had in Puerto Rico. At least that's the way they saw it, you know, at the time. Um, and you know, just chasing that American dream, right? M making sure their kids got educated. You know, my dad was, you know, he, he I don't think he finished college, but he did get to go to college. He was a lab technician, a pseudo intellect. My dad was very smart. Um, you know, my mother, you know, she met him when she was 18, so it wasn't like, you know, she needed to go out and get a profession. She became, you know, a mom, you know, a housewife, um, like 
most of the Latinas, most of the Puerto Rican women back in those days. They were housewives, you know. Um, so yeah, uh, they grew up, you know, to chase again, to, to look for bigger and better, you know. Um, you know, my father found his wife, had kids, you know, ended up buying a house. And, you know, the aim was to raise us, you know, to be better than them, right? To get more than them. Um, unfortunately, my father was murdered when, when I was 11. Um, you know, part of the neighborhood politics, uh, you know, he, he worked with Badillo at the time, Herman Badillo, which was mm -hmm. the Bronx Borough president. He campaigned for him. So I don't know the full story, um, but uh, he ended up getting shot, shot in the heart. You know, um, he was there one day, gone the next. And, you know, you could imagine, you know, what came after that for me um, and my brothers. Yeah. yeah. So. So, but again, How you know, you? I was 11 when my father was murdered. Um, yeah. Uh, Sorry. Yeah, no, you know, um, you know, a lot of healing done. There was a time in my life where um, I felt that, you know, I was dealt, you know, a, 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 a sour pair of cards. Um, right. I was angry. You know, I wanted revenge, you know, so for a good part of my life, you know, I, I, I was angry, you know, and um, I lived that way. And everything that came out of me, you know, was out of anger, you know, which is why, you know, my struggle, part of my struggle, you know, we all have a struggle. You know, mine was anger based. Um, and it's because I had lost my father and I felt that was unfair. Wow. Wow. That's deep, you know. Um, so what did... Where did they end up raising you guys? And when were you born? Yeah, so I was born in 1958. Um, you know, we lived in a couple of different places until we settled pretty early on. I think I was about four years old when we moved to Prospect Avenue. It was between 181st and 182nd. Um, so that's the Cretona area of the Bronx. Um, my father bought a, bought a house. It, it was a two-family house, and then he, he turned it into a one-family house. Um, so, it, it, you know, it was cool. My father was my boxing coach, you know, um, my, you know, he taught me how to play baseball. I was a very good baseball player as, you know, as a young, young person. Um, and, and, you know, again, my father was the type, we had a house, we had a yard. Um, a lot of kids in my neighborhood didn't. So they hung out in my house. They hung out in my backyard. We'd fill up the car to get to, to go to the baseball field and, we, you know, basically a team, you know, you know and, and we were a mix of Puerto Rican and black, right? Because I lived on one side, on 180th, there was the blacks, black community, and then on 182nd was the Puerto Rican community. And, you know, and we mixed everything in between, you know, in the middle where I live. Um, so, yeah, that, so early on, it was all about sports. You know, I played baseball, played basketball, um, and back then, you know, it was one neighborhood against the other, right? Uh -huh. So, you know, it wasn't, you know, and, and, I, and I need to say this because I think it's important. It wasn't Puerto Ricans against Blacks. It was Puerto Ricans and Blacks against other Puerto Ricans and Blacks. Got it. And the mix was pretty powerful. Neighborhoods then. versus neighborhoods. Neighborhood versus neighborhood, right. And you just go from one block down to the other block to the other block. So it was... Um, and we all met, you know, at the same place, right? It was either uh, Belmont Park, where we played basketball and played football. Okay. Or uh, a little further down was Fireman's Field, where we played baseball. Um, so it was, it was rich. It was a rich neighborhood. We got to do what all kids did. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe we, we didn't have everything, you know, some of the other, what, what some of the other kids had, but we had enough. Got it, got it. And I mean, since you're talking about that, other than sports, what were some of the neighborhood games that you played in the 60s is when you grew up? Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, it was, it was total, you know, creativity, right? So I think it started, I think the first game I played uh, was red light, green light, right, one, right. two, three. Um, and then as we got older and we can go outside, we started to play Red Livio, um, kick the can, um, you know, we played Skelzies. I mean, you know, and, and then, you know, who knows what other games we created. Hot Piece of Butter was a big one, right? We chased with the belt, 
<laughs> to, to whack each other. Um, uh, Johnny on the Pony was a little bit early, but we, you know, right. we did that also. Um, but yeah, and um, and it's funny because we had um, yeah, Five and Field was a long, long walk, so you you had uh, empty lots, you know, with rocks and stuff like that. But we would turn that into a baseball field, and we 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 play baseball on these empty lots. Um, um, my backyard, we put basketball courts on each end, and we used to run full courts. So, you know, um, the, the greatest games was off the wall, off the point, right? Where we would play, we would have a, we would, it, it would be like seven on seven. We put everybody on the street, it'd be a field, you know, there was stick ball. I mean, now that I'm thinking about it, I could go on and on. Right. I mean, the games that we created out of boredom were, were pretty un unbelievable. Yeah, that was before the, the iPhone and, and all the apps. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. And it, and it forced us to connect good, bad, or indifferent, right? Uh, you know, I mean, you, you'd fight over, you know, who was safe or who, you know, who you thought you were safe or, you know, you were out. And it turned into an argument and a fist fight. Um, but then it'd be like, okay, you know, it's over and we start to play again and we, you know, come back together, you know? Um, so we were forced, you know, you talk about conflict resolution, and I'm thinking about that now, you know, we were great at that. You know, we, we, we created our own conflict, but we resolved it, at this, you know, also. Right. Yeah. So it was, yeah, man, and, and um, reflecting on it, I think that's, you know, where I'm at now at 65 years old, the wisdom I possess, you know, I could trace it back to them, you know, that's where this all started. I mean, school was one thing, but the education I got while growing up on the street of New York, the Bronx, was also pretty valuable. Wow, wow. And uh, getting back to the house, what what kind of music did your parents listen to? Yeah, it was salsa, you know? Um, you know, mambo, I guess they called it back then. You know, right. but my dad, so my family was, it was musical, right? So uh, my cousins were the Pastrana brothers. Pastrana brothers were, were musicians back then. Well, no, I mean, they were they were in competition and coming up with Willie Colon, uh, Ruben Blades, um, Hector Lavoe. I mean, there was all, you know, they were in there, you know, and they were up and coming. They several albums, you know. Um, they, you know, they added to their own demise, you know, um, but Still, that was my family. So it was music all the time. My father had the, the, the best, the most sophisticated sound system in the neighborhood. Right? He had these big speakers. He had a turntable. Most people didn't have that. They had a record player, you know. Right, right. But we had a sound, a stereo system. Um, so and it was music all day long. My father was, you know, sad settle, you know, and parties in my house every weekend. You know, cousins would come over, you know, my younger cousins would hang with us. And then, of course, the parents, you know, they, they partied. They partied. I mean, that was that was instilled in me early, you know, the fun that you got from partying. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, it was a foundation for me. You know, I was also, you know, you know, always wanted to be the center of attraction, not just me, but my cousins, my brothers. And so we learned how to dance salsa, right? We were, we were cute at it. We weren't great at it, but we were cute at it, right? Um, back then, again, everything was, you know, the, the, the um, I don't know if it was a conscious goal, but everybody looked to be Americanized. So we even came up, the Latino community came up with the Boogaloo, the Latin Boogaloo, which was English lyrics to, you know, a, you know Latino flavor, Spanish flavor, Puerto Rican flavor. Um, and we created dances to those songs, right? That, that movement, you know, the African twist by Eddie Palmetti. You know, there was a dance called the African twist, right? right? Um, bang, bang, we dance, you know, Joe Cuba, push, push. The, those were all, you know, um, Latino songs, but with American lyrics. So that was our, our push towards becoming Americanized. Got it. Wow, wow. And uh, tell me about in the 60s growing up, any gangs in your neighborhood? What was that like? Oh, so... Were they visible? Yeah, yeah oh yeah, yeah. Especially, um, 
So the 60s, it was more, it wasn't so much the gangs. I mean, you had the black, in my neighborhood, you had the black Falcons. They were older. They were more of an organization than they were a gang. Um, but I think closer to, I think it was more like the 70s, uh, early 70s, where you had Black Spades, the Royal Javelins, the Seven Models. I mean, we had every single gang in our neighborhood, right? And at that time, the neighborhood, the neighborhood kind of extended itself. So you'd have Katona, but you go all the way down to Ho Avenue and all this, mm -hmm. right? So and you had the, the Dirty Dozen, the Bachelors. I mean, over by Brook Avenue, you had the Brothers of Satan. I mean, there was like countless dancers. The Ghetto Brothers was like a huge gang right. that was more like an organization. And they did some good things, you know. Um, but again, they, I, I, I wasn't part of the gangs. Um, my father always said to me, and, you know, again, this is how I grew up and this is how, what shaped my paradigm. I'm not judging anybody. But my father used to say, if you need to be in the gang, it means you're scared. You're a punk. So I always, for some reason, that always stuck with me. So I used to get recruited by the gangs all the time. You know, Black Spades, Artie, was the president at the time. He loved me. He always said, this is your place. This is where you need to be. And I just, you know, again, I was more into the sports. You know, I played baseball. You know, eventually I got really good at basketball. Um, so that was my thing. And then very quickly, dance came into my life, right? Got so it. that's what I was attracted to more. So, and, and also um, there was a certain um, attire that came with, you know, with gangs. They wore, you know, jack knee jackets, right? With colors and these, you know, MC boots. And it was, it was, it wasn't something I was attracted to. I was more attracted to the drug dealers who wore alpacas and shark skins and these brothers dressed. They used to change like two, three times a day. God. That's what I was attracted to. And, and this whole dance world I became part of had that flavor, right? They dressed to impress. Right. Um, so it was, it, you know, so it went from alpacas to shirts called Nick Nicks and Huckapoos, but they were fly. They were beautiful. There was in the, the pants, you know, right. we wore, there was, I remember going to my first club. It was called the Contiki. My first club was the Fresh, but then the following week I went to the Contiki. The Contiki, they were a little bit more mature than they were in the Fresh in, in terms of age. And they used to wear, you know, the old time mafia suits. And I was like, where you get these from? And they were like, the drift shops, man. Yeah. What? And then, you know, I went and I got me a couple of suits. So it was all about, you know, dressing to the the best you can, you right. know, it was, it was about dressing to impress. So that's what I was attracted to. I wasn't attracted to, you know, the, the jean jackets cut off with colors. That's not what I, I wanted. I didn't, I didn't, that whole way of being, that didn't attract me. Got it, got it. What, what year did you first see someone do the rock dance and what was your impression? So it was, it was 72. Like I, I had, I had been dancing, right? And I, and I, and I thought I was a good dancer. You're 14, 15 and 72. Yeah, maybe, uh, yeah, definitely, yeah, 14. Yeah, yeah. So probably, you know, I, I seen it before, right? So 13, let's say 13, you know, 71. Um, I saw it in the neighborhood, right? So it was, it was okay. It was good. And, and I became good at it. Right. So that's when I first saw it. But then there was a day I was at a party and this was in 72. Um, it was a, it was at that time I just went to parties. Right. Um, I, I hadn't hit the clubs yet. Um, so it was the neighborhood. It was out in the street. It was in, in, in parties, basement parties. So I was at a basement party and there wasn't too many people there, but the music was really nice. I was hearing songs that I never heard before. And this brother walked in um, with two other guys. His name was Puppet, and he started to dance. And I was like, what is that? So that was rock on another level. God. That they would, that's the rock that they were doing in these places that were underground that not many people knew about. I didn't know anything about it. So at that party, you know, 
I, you know, he saw me dance a little bit because I was intimidated, you know, so he called me over, showed me some steps, I could pick it up. And he said, dude, let's, you know, let's, let's get out of here. I got a place to go to. Um, so he took me to a club that wasn't too far from the party. Mm -hmm. And there was nobody there. It was called The Joint. Um, but the music was pumping. I mean, it was painted all in black. They had lights. So again, stuff that I wasn't familiar with, stuff that I never saw before. And we, we danced, you know, it was just us in there, it was empty, and we danced. And then the following week, he took me to the Fresh. Um, the Fresh is where I saw the best of the best. I mean, this place was wall to wall, you know. It was Latino, but it was, I'd say, like 99.9% .9 Puerto Rican. And these brothers and sisters, the way they danced was unbelievable. So that was rock, you know, right. to the tent. Got it, got it. In your opinion or experience, does the rock dance have any association with gangs or evolved out of? Uh, no, no, no. Um, you know, gangs did their thing, right? And that was separate from what I experienced. You know, I, I, I knew gangs to gang bang, right? They, they right. did gang stuff. It wasn't, it wasn't, you know, nothing like what I saw when I hit this club. So. It was pretty much separate. Um, you know, again, you know, gangs, they had their parties, they hung out, they drank, they drugged, they did whatever they did, and they partied and they danced, right? But not nowhere near what I had experienced, um, let's say, you know, when I first went to the Fresh. And after the Fresh, that opened up a whole world for me, a whole world. It was underground, but it existed and it was very powerful, it was very explosive. You know, again, I had the foundation for partying, right? Because we right. partied in my house. This partying was, again, to the 10th degree. It was, it was pretty amazing. Got it, got it. Does the rock dance have certain elements or certain styles within the rock dance? And I guess what I'm alluding to is, you know, I've heard, uh, you know, you've had, you have the freestyle, you have the jerk, you have burning. Right. You know, talk to me about those things okay. or any other elements I didn't. Yeah, touch. yeah, yeah. So the jerk, it wasn't, it wasn't really done much. So there was a couple of guys that I knew. There was one guy named Little who was um, the the partner of probably the person who was most known. His name is Rubber Band. He, okay. He's probably the most renowned. Right, because Rubber Band was tremendous at promoting himself. You know, um, I was talking to an OG the other day, and he compared Rubber Band to MC Hammer. Um, he had that kind of flair to him. Um, so he wasn't the best dancer, but he got the most attention because he just knew how to draw it. And this guy, Little, who was from El Barrio, Puerto Riqueño, a Boricua, he was also a great dancer, and although they weren't really partners because Rubber Band was a loner, Little was a loner, but at that time we had these competitions and these clubs. You had a contest every weekend, and you had to, you know, it was two, you had to have a partner. So for these contests, Little and, and Rubber Band got together, right? And Little did the jerk, right? But it was a dance move. It wasn't an entire dance. Got it. So the jerk was mixed in with a plethora. I'm talking about, you know, a, it, it, that's why I call rock, not just the dance, but it, it, it was a genre, right. right? Because there was so many different steps to it, so many different styles. Um, some people moved one way, you know, other people moved another way. You had, you had the sophisticated rock dancers who did some great footwork, reminiscent to Mambo and Sasa, you know? They moved their hips like Sacedos did, right? But then you had guys like Rubber Band. See, so I was, that's the kind of dancer I was. But then you had guys like Rubber Band who wasn't, didn't move that well, but they were crazy with floor moves, right? They did, they did splits. Back then, the helicopter was a regular for Rubber Band. You know, what we used to call, we used to say, oh, he's throwing his body around. Now they call them swipes. Um, so a lot of the, you know, the B-boy steps, the breaking steps, rubber band and guys like rubber band who went to the floor did those. Um, I can't say, you know, to what extent, but they went to the floor um, and they were spectacular. 
there was these brothers from Washington Heights. These guys were Dominicanos, Papo and Charlie. They went airborne. Okay. <laughs> these guys were doing flips and incorporating it into the dance. So there was, you know, there was two ways, right? So we talked the spectacular, but we also talked the sophisticated. Um, the sophisticated was the one that I believe evolved into everything later. You know, maybe not, definitely not what they were doing in the West Coast, which was locking, but definitely in the East Coast. So this rock dance, it, it turned into house, right? It turned into hip hop. Um, it definitely, you know, the, the, uh, the connection to breaking, um, lofting, and most dances that came out of the East Coast, you know, you could see rock in, in all of them. Yeah. Does, does the, the roots of rock dance, what, what other dances, and we, you know, we can dig forever generations back, but the immediate dances leading up that evolved into the rock dance. Okay, so what were those popular dances? Perfect, great question. So it was to me, it was a combination of things, right? So um, the black and brown community was together, right? Like I said, it was. It this was, was the sixties. Yeah, this 70s. was the sixties. This was, um, I'd say, sixty-seven, sixty-eight, sixty-nine, right? Where certain dances came out and they went to certain songs. So when a song came out, for some reason, I mean, I, I can't say where exactly it came from. But it, a, a dance was created to the song that everybody did. For instance, the song, the Tighten Up, Archie Bell and the Drugs, right? There was a dance called the Tighten Up, a beautiful dance. I knew how to do that dance as a kid. That's the other thing. Because we did salsa at home, I could pick up dances. So the teenagers would, you know, in my neighborhood would show me steps and I'd pick it up. So the Tighten Up was a dance, right? Um, one of the best dances that I ever saw that had all this groove in it was the Mother Popcorn, God. right? And that was a song, right? It was the song by James Brown called the Mother Popcorn. You know, the community turned it into a dance. Now we're talking about the street. Now this is stone cold street culture, right? They didn't do this stuff anywhere else. It came from the street. Then there was in a host of other dances. There was the Hustler. The click clack. Remember, the, the, there was a, a, a sort right. of like a toy, a game called That's the right. click clack. There was a dance called the click clack. Scorpio, Dennis Coffey came out with a song, right? We had a dance called Scorpio, you know? Um, the Good Foot, James Brown. Again, we had a dance called the Good Foot. Um, so that was all the late 60s. So it was those dances, though, that had a certain groove, right? Because mm. they were soulful, right? So... But at the same time now, now that was the black and brown community together, right? The brown community, the Puerto Ricans, the Boricuas at home was dancing salsa, right? And merengue, right? And the cha-cha was big at that time, right? And we already was doing the Latin boogaloo. So we had this, this flavor, you know, in us that nobody else had. White, black, I don't care. Nobody had this flavor that we had. So when we hit these clubs, right? Now I'm talking about like 1970. I wasn't part of this, but my mentors, the guys I watched, the guys I learned from were right smack in the middle of this. Who are your mentors? Um, this brother named Mike Dominguez. You know, he's from 90th Street. You know, he's, he goes back to 1970. Um, so, so when I first went out, when I went to the Fresh, there was a group of guys I saw, right? So there was Didi from Brooke. Um, his partner, Louie, was from Brooklyn, right? Awesome. Louie was, like, off the charts. I watched him. He spent, he had his long coat. We called it Maxis, mm -hmm. and the coat would just, it, he looked like an ice skater, the way he spent, right? Wow. So that night I saw him. I was like, wow. I was just, I was in awe. Um, and then I saw a rubber band, and, and that's the person I went to actually see. Puppet said, you got to come see rubber band. So that's who I saw, and, and he was amazing, I like Louie and Didi better, but still, Rubber Band, Mexico was another one. These guys were there before me, and then I saw the, 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 these young women, you know, Anna and Janet. They were doing a routine, and again, I was like, Anna, I was like mesmerized, um, but then there was a circle. Everybody had, had went to another circle, and there, there were these brothers, um, Johnny and Hector. They were like five foot five, right? both short guys but they were perpetual motion. They were, you know, like speedsters. And those are the guys I got attracted to the most. 
So that's my first introduction to rock. I saw the best of the best. And then, you know, the following year, as I kept going, as I, I kept developing as a dancer, I met the guys from 90th Street. Again, Mike Dominguez, um, Danny Rodriguez, Hector Delgado. Those three guys are still around and we still talk. They were freaking amazing. You talk about sophistication. You talk about the groove that we had when we did those dances in the 60s, right, in the late 60s. And then you talk about the salsa and the merengue. I mean, these guys combined all of it. And if that wasn't enough, you know, these brothers used to watch, you know, Mikhail Baryshnikov and, and Gregory Hines, and they incorporated that jazz and tap into rock. So that's why I say rock was a genre. It wasn't just a dance. And that's why it was able to, I guess, evolve or maybe connect to all these other dances that came later. You know, that's 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 where I get you know my thought from my thoughts and my paradigm in terms of the dance and how it grew and how it evolved. Um, but so all those all, all that was included. There was a time. Um, <laughs> so me and my partner Enoch Enoch ended up to me being the greatest ever. I mean he was he was amazing, right? He was like an angel on the dance floor. Um, but again, we we came a little bit later. And we kind of like took over. Like at the end, there, uh, 90th Street was the top of the hierarchy in, in terms of dance. But me and Enoch, we got down and then we bumped them. And we became, I remember this guy Spanky said, they're no longer, you know, the best. He said, you and Enoch are the best. So um, what year was that when you we Enoch developed got 74, I'd say, 70, the end of 73, 74. Um, that's when we connected. You know, he had partners before me. As a matter of fact, his cousin was Anna, the, 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 the woman I mentioned. Um, and her brother, George, was also. There was just so many of us. I mean, this, these clubs, they were underground clubs. They were extraordinary. Um, they, they were wall to wall, and they're mostly, you know, Puerto Ricans. And all they did was dance. Right, this music that that these DJs played—they were the only ones that had access to this this music at that time. Right, they didn't play this music in the radio, so that music, the ambiance, right, the atmosphere of the club, the lights, is what brought out this this creativity in us, and that's how we came up with this dance called rock. But it was because of these DJs and this music that was played that actually today are still considered like, some of them are still like B-boy anthems. Got it. Got they go back to the 70s, you know, even 69, Give It Up, Turn It Loose, that was 1969. You know, Just Begun, I think was 71 or 72. Like, like when you look at Wikipedia or, and, and they talk about the date that they first came out, they actually came out a year earlier. Because again, these DJs, um, had access, right? So, so the record companies didn't go to the radio anymore after these DJs. And I guess I could talk about this too. Yeah, when, 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 when they found mixing. So there was a brother who was a sound person in most of these clubs. It was the same guy. His name was Alex Rosner. Um, he connected with the DJs, right? And, and he gave them something to work with, which was called the mixer. He invented the mixer for, for two turntables. Right. They already mixed all kinds of different things at that time. But the mixer for two turntables was invented by Alex Rosner. And the first DJs he gave it to were the DJs in these clubs, right? So the Sanctuary was, uh, I could, you know, Sanctuary, Kantiki, um, the Ruby Fool, the Pegasus. There's, there's like 30 clubs that I can go through and I can mention. But so Francis Grasso, who was considered the best at that time, the guy was a genius. He was already like mixing, like putting music together, he called it blending and changing before the mixer. So when the mixer came out, it just took him to another level. He was, the sanctuary, you know, in my day is considered the greatest club of all time, you know, for, for more than one reason, right? Um, but um, so he, Francis Grasso was there, right? There was Nick, Nicky Sayano, who was, who was a, in another great club called The Gallery. Um, David Mancuso started the loft. The loft was his apartment, right? And he started, you know, throwing parties, and that became a club, right? Um, the the one that we followed 
right? The Latinos, the Puerto Ricans, was Alfie Davidson. Alfie Davidson was black. And he was, I mean, he's the one that I first heard extend breaks. So like, like give it up and turn it loose, right? So there was a part, right? The break part, and it'd go doom to doom, right? So he would take, well, once it said doom to doom, he'd take it back to the beginning of the break part. And then get to do 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 again, and then go back to begin. And he did that like three, four times before letting it go, right? So that he did that with just begun. He did that with a lot of the songs that had these these breaks in them. Um, and the reason why he did it, and I, I remember, you know, because we used to hang. I mean, it was a close, it was a close knit community. Mm -hmm. And he said, "I'm doing that for y'all. Y'all guys who dance, y'all make me play the way I play." And then you know, and 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 then we say, you know. You make us play, you make us dance the way we dance. So there was that connection between the DJ and the dancers that I don't think ever existed before. Again, I don't think it could because they didn't have mixers before that. So I think the mixers made that happen because again, it was nonstop music. You never took a break from being in that element, right? Once you got in that zone, that zone lasted for hours unless they decided to take a break and put on slow music mm -hmm. or a different kind of soulful music that was a little softer and we still dance rock to, but it wasn't that competitive, like just begun. Everybody went, got their partner and it was like throwdown time. Um, give it up and turn it loose. Black skin, blue eyed boy. Um, get into something by the, the Isley brothers. Right. Um, uh, uh, um, the the cool in the gang um love the life you live i mean there's again a, a bunch of songs that you know i can i can I probably got a list at home but right, right. You know, come up with them on the spot you know but there was again and and this is the music that we you know the boricua community connected to right now the thing about this music and this is something i found out recently as i got back into this world so this music, though, I'm, I'm talking about all these songs had like a certain percussion to them, right? It wasn't like rock or, or other R&B music, you know, the slower versions. These particular songs that I'm talking about had this percussion element to it, right? So they had the bongos, they had the, um, the timbales, you know, you, you got clave. I mean, it had this flavor that I believe came from the Latino music community, right? Which is why it was the Puerto Ricans who connected to this music and came up with this dance called rock. I think that's the reason because, so before that, you know, people, you know, people danced, but they didn't include their hips or their rib cages or their shoulders like we did. We even moved our head, you know? So it was... It, it was, I believe, that percussion that we connected to because we've been connecting it, connecting to it since we were like two, three years old at home, you know. And most of like when I talk to Mike Dominguez and Hector and anybody I talk to, we go back that far. And we, you know, we share experiences that, you know, the the this this experience this this musical experience we had in our homes. We all dance salsa. You know, our fathers, our mothers. Um, in fact, Brenda K. Starr, I think Mike Dominguez's father might have been a singer. Brenda K. Starr is Mike Dominguez's sister. Okay. Right? She used to, when we used to go to his house to hang, because Mike was, Mike was very giving with his stuff. So it wasn't like, you know, he, at, at, when I, you know, there was a time when Mike was, Mike, Mike set the trend. As a dancer, as a dresser, everybody wanted to be like Mike. So, and Mike liked me and Enoch, he took us under his wing. So we went to his house and he would show us stuff. And Brenda, Brenda K-Star, right? Brenda used to come into the room and interrupt and he'd have to throw out the room, but she grew up in this, you know, this, this time that I consider to be, a, you know, cultural and musical phenomenon. Um, so, so yeah, so again, rock, the roots of rock, um, is, 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 is a pretty amazing story. It's, it, it connects to, you know, a lot more than just, you know, what we did in, in that time, right? So, you know, again, mambo, merengue, cha-cha, you know, we got to keep that in mind. That's what made us, 
different than anybody else, right? So the, the, the Boricuas became the power, right? When we came to dance, there was nobody better than us. Um, there was a, a time, so there was, there was this other club, right? I mentioned a lot of different clubs. There was a club called the Leviticus. Now the Leviticus was a black club, right? It was mostly people from the black community. This club was freaking amazing. It was in red and white. It was, it was beautiful. Um, and, and, you know, business, a lot of black businessmen, you know, music producers, they all went to the Leviticus. Leviticus was the place to go to. It was also in Manhattan, and it was a, a, a club, a disco, just like the sanctuary. It was, that was their version of their disco. Um, and even there, you know, they danced and they partied, but they couldn't do what we did. So they knew about us. So they hired me and my partner to come in and dance. So we, we did a show for them at the Little Bit Leviticus. We tore it up. We tore it down. You know, there was uh, one of the DJs there. His name was Victor Cook. You know, he's another one who, who was part of this, this group of DJs, mm -hmm. right? And, and he played the song that, that you know, because he knew it, right? He, uh, we, we danced to It's a New Day by James Brown. Um, and from the Leviticus, a scout from Barry Gordy's company, Motown, saw us. And we got a gig to play for Barry Gordy's birthday party, I think a month later. What year was that? Had to be 74. Could have been 75. But me and Enoch were already established. We were the best, you know, we were known to be the best dancers. Rock was probably at its peak at that time. Mm -hmm. And it had made its way into the other venues, right? It, had, it, wasn't, it wasn't no longer an underground dance. You had mentioned a little earlier, kind of sticking with the DJ thing, about the record companies and the labels not sending the records to uh, the radio stations, but sending them to the DJs first. Right. Uh, are, are you alluding to uh, DJ pools? DJ? DJ pools? Yes. So this was, okay. And record pools? Perfect, perfect. So this was the first record pool. Right? After the mixing came, they might they might have been getting together already, because again, they had these clubs where, so before the, the mixer and, and these DJs came and blew up this whole, you know, it was, it was, it was a phenomenon, right? So before that, they were still DJing, but they would DJ like one record at a time. And it was mostly the clubs would bring in bands. So it was mostly bands that played. And then, you know, they'll take a break and the DJ would play, mm -hmm. you know. So they, and, and these DJs kind of like knew each other because the clubs were catching fire, right? You had the Cheetah. You had a lot of other clubs that, that weren't yet what they called juice bars that turned into discos. That wasn't happening just yet. But so these DJs, once the mixing took place, and these record companies started to contact these DJs. They created the very, very first record pool. Very, I mean, this was the beginning of record pools. Well, what years were that? That had to be late 69, 70. I think the mixer, it, it, the, the mixer was created, I think, 70 or 71. He invented it. But it, it was already happening. This phenomenon had already started to take place, which is why it led to you know, Rosner, you know, inventing the mixer. You know, he said, I got to come up with something better than what we have. Um, so this, these DJs were already getting together, right? So we're talking Francis Grasso, Nick Sayano, Victor Cook, um, uh, Richie Casar was, was the Hollywood. You know, so what, I've, what I haven't mentioned is, um, so it was Puerto Ricanos, right, in these clubs, but then there were other clubs at the same time with these DJs, but it was the gay community. So that was, and, and then we oftentimes came together, right, because the after hours were mostly the gay communities, and we didn't want to stop. We partied, I mean, and, and I'll say a little something about those days when we partied. It wasn't just the weekends. It wasn't just night. We went, we would go 16, 17 hours of party but so going back to the djs so it was these djs that you know were part of that very beginning so they formed like a, a membership a club and that became the record pool um so you had those djs and then and then you had david rodriguez 
Um, and then later on, a little later, you had protégés starting to come in, right? You had Lavi Levine, um, who's a well-known house DJ. Um, you had Frankie Knuckles, another house DJ. You had our very own Jelly Bean Benitez, who came from Davidson Avenue, Harrison Avenue, up by Burnside. You know, Jelly Bean is a Bronx boy. Jelly Bean started out as a rock dancer, right? He used to come to my house. We used to practice. But he also had DJ equipment and had aspirations to be a DJ. And we really didn't pay attention to that, not knowing that Jelly Bean was going to become one of the greatest DJs of all time. So, so because of this power, these, these DJs gained a lot of power, right? So the clubs used to get packed. And, you know, when you're part of an underground movement, everybody wants to know something about that, right? And that's like... If you, if you stay ahead of the game, right, if you're a businessman, mm -hmm. you know, you're going to say, let's do our thing there because then it'll blow up from there. And my guess is that's what the record companies did. Right? They saw the power that these DJs had. Right? They saw how, you know, it, 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 this music, I don't know if it was radio music. I don't know if it mm -hmm. was, you know, the, the, the regular pop stuff that people were, were used to. Um, so... I think that's why they went and they gave their songs to the DJs first. And then I think a year or two years later, then they would be exposed to the, to the larger community. But, but these record companies went to, DJ, to these DJs first. And it was, I mean, look what it turned out to be. I mean, it exploded into a global phenomenon that is still exists today. So they did something right back then. Right. You named some clubs that were extremely popular, especially in my day. And we're talking the mid-80s. Mm -hmm. You know, the loft was still around yes. and hitting heavy. Right. But you mentioned juice bars. Talk to me about the significance of juice bars and okay. the contribution to the rock bands, if any. Right. So, the, so that's what they call these clubs first. They didn't call them clubs. They didn't call them juice bars. They might have, you know, I, I mean, you know, may have referred to, you know, the bigger picture as clubs. But these particular places, they call them juice bars because... Again, it was it, it 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 blew up real fast, right? So once these DJs came in, and once this dance came came about, these places used to get packed, and people used to come from all over the place. I mean, I remember being there one night, and and there was this group from Paris at the Fresh, right? So when everybody left, I was I was just beginning. When everybody left, we got on the floor, right? When the the cats away, the mice will play. Well, we were playing. So, but these people were from, from France. You know, you have people coming in from Delaware, you know, Jersey. Uh, uh, it, this, this was, I mean, so the influence was huge. So the businessmen knew exactly what they were doing, right? Mm -hmm. So because it was so fast, so when, when, when these clubs opened up, right, it took like five, six years at that time to get a liquor license, right? So there was no liquor in these clubs. They gave out juice, which is why they call them juice bars. Got it, got it. And uh, I know you were never a, a into breaking, right? That was a, a genre that came up right after after you. Right. But now, you know, you're collaborating with with some you know some significant b boys, you know, in the industry. In your your experience from the rock dance and coming to today and looking at the linkages between up rock. Tell us about those commonalities in the rock dance and in the b-boys up rock. Yeah, so um, so there's elements back in those days that they that, you know that that you know transcended itself, right? So the whole so they call up rocking burning, right? So that whole word burning came from the community I was part of, but it, burning wasn't considered a dance. So what happened was if I got into a circle with rubber band and I, and I outdid rubber band, right? And it wasn't about embarrassing each other. Like up rock, they do a lot of um, sexual and violent moves. You know, right. we didn't do that, right? We just danced. So whoever was the best dancer, that's who they say burn, did the burning, right? So when I'm going home on the train, you know, my boys are like, yo, you burned rubber band tonight. Yo, you burned this person. Oh, that person burned that person. So it was just a way of claiming victory. That was the word we used to claim victory. It, 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 
it, it, it became something else later on, right? And, and the uprock community took that. Um, well, not took it, it just, it just evolved that way, right? It just happened that way. Um, the other thing I think what, what happened was, so it, it went a different way, but it still had traces of rock because I believe the up rockers are, are, are much younger, right? You know, you got King Up Rock, you got Ringo. These are the guys I know, Mighty Mike. They're younger than I am by like five, six, seven, sometimes even 10 years. But that's a big deal when you're 14 and 15, you know, and you're 10, you know, but I think we were around enough because we were on the street. We came from, we, we were part of the street culture. Rock is a direct descendant from the street culture, right? Um, so we were in parks, we were, so they got to see us, but that, but we wasn't around to pass the dance on to these younger dancers, got it. right? Because there was really no place for us to go, right? So, like I said, we used to party. We used to dance seven days a week, right? We go from a club, let's say in a weekend, to Central Park, the fountain. The fountain was huge. We, we, we owned the fountain. I mean, this place would be packed at 10 o'clock in the morning, 9 o'clock in the morning, when the DJs brought their equipment from the club to Central Park. And that was Saturday and Sunday. So you go from the club, maybe go home, or maybe go straight to the park and party all day to get ready for the night. On the weekday, you had hooky parties. That was Seth, that was five days a week where you, you got up to go to school, but you never made it to school. You went to these hooky places, right? We call them hooky clubs, hooky parties, mm -hmm. to dance all day. So rock was around, you know, that was around the clock. So we either, and, and you, you just can't survive that way. So we either, a lot of us either burnt out or, you know, like in my case, my mother was like, you can't do this, man. You got to go back to school. You, Because I wasn't going to school. I was playing hooky. Mm -hmm. So there was pressure to do more. Um, and, and, and that was all of us who felt it at the same time. So my partner got into the religion. He became a Christian, a born-again Christian. Mike Dominguez became a boxer. Mike Dominguez won Golden Gloves twice and became a pro boxer. And that's Brenda K. Starr's that's brother. That's Brenda K. Starr's brother. I mean, he was Alexis Arguello's sparring partner. He prepared Alexis Arguello for, for um, butt kicking from Aaron Pryor. But still, Mike was, you know, Danny became, you know, he, he got a job with the Board of Education. You know, some of us, you know, ended up in jail, right? You know, some of us died. So... I call us the disappearance of a generation. So we wasn't there to pass the baton, but we were there long enough to have an impact. And that's what Wiggles, that's what Wiggles went by. That's why Wiggles said there's more to it than this. And he did his research and it was Mr. Wiggles who found me. Got it. Talk to us about the connection between you and Mick Wiggles. How you first, how he found you. Yeah. So. <clears throat> um, I'm, I'm, I'm working at a school now. I'm a counselor. And this was, this had, this was 2010, 2011. And I get a phone call from this brother named Mr. Wiggles. Now, I think I had, well, at the time, I said, Mr. who the hell is Mr. Wiggles, right? But then I go back. And, and so I, after I left dance, I loved the entertainment part of it because me and my partner were doing shows, right? And we were getting paid. Not much, but we were getting paid. Um, but I love the entertainment part of it. So when I went to college, I studied acting, right? So I was in a movie called Beat Street. Um, I was an extra. Okay. And Mr. Wiggles was there, Fable. But I didn't put all that together. I didn't, man, I didn't make the connection back then. I didn't make the connection until I get a call from a dude named Mr. Wiggles. And he says, the first thing he says, I've been looking for you for a while. I've been doing a re the research. As he said, I'm a b-boy. I'm a popper. You know, I've I've been traveling the world, um, and I've been you know my 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 uh, my curiosity you know became where did this all come from? And when I started to do my research, it led me back to you, you know, because I'm the one that people knew, right? That and not that I mean I'm not you know I'm not saying I was known. But he went to someone and said, oh, maybe you should talk to this dude named Papo. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. You know, he was he was known back then. So so that so he connected with me and brought me out to this world that I didn't even know it, it existed. Right? Because I'm busy now. I got a family. You know, I moved on. You know, my my thing is is work. You know, it, you know, for a little while it was theater. It was no longer this street style dance that you know me and my boys were part of. You know, we we kind of like stood away. Like, you know, for instance, there was um, so there was you know I was working for this company, uh, this this community-based organization called Davidson Community Center, and we were doing AIDS outreaches, right? So we would give out condoms and literature, and we was on the corner of Davidson and Burnside giving out this stuff, and and the, the guys, I, I was supervising this program, so they, they sent somebody to say, oh, we, we ran out of condoms, we need another box. So I brought the box out to them, um, and there was this guy there, right? So when I left, this guy walks up to them and said, yo, was that Papu? Now there was a breaker named Speedy D, who was part of my outreach crew. So he says, "What do you want with him?" He says, "Yo, him and Enoch were like the best street style dancers there was back in the '70s." <laughs> my wife also worked; she was an outreach worker. She worked, you know, she was part of my crew. And after that, they packed up, they came inside, and they confronted me. He said, "Why you never talked to us about being a dancer? I never even mentioned it." You know, my heart was kind of, I was, you know, there was disappointment. My heart was broken because I thought we were going to be stars, right? That's, that's how, um, how impactful this dance was. It had me believing that Hollywood was going to discover me and my partner. And you know what? They did because we did a show at this club called The Reflections. And it was, it was a, a, much, a much more mature crowd. And this probably was 75, 76 when we were starting to um, tail off. Um, and there was a scout from Johnny Carson show at, at, this, at the Reflections where we were going to perform. Now, we were part of a company called the Latin Symbolics. We were their original members, right? So they, there was, they, they had the Hustle, they had Salsa, and, and then we, we were rock, right? So everybody performed that night. The scout from the Johnny Carson show said, we just want those two. We just want Papu and Enoch. You know, George, who was the executive director, he said, you got to take the whole group. You just can't take them. And then they said, well, you know, let us ask them. And when they came and they asked us, I felt loyal to George. George did some beautiful things for us. So I said, you know, now I, you know, I wonder if I should have. But I said, no, if you can't take the whole dance, dance company, then, then you, you can't have us. And they said, OK, I." <laughs> So although, you know, again, I was, I was blind to this world that was taking place. Um, once I met with, with Mr. Wiggles, it took me a while because I just took that as, you know, a nice thing that happened. Um, but then months later, um, I got a call from my brother-in-law, who's the president of TBB, you know, Abby. Abby is the president of TBB. And the Bronx I'm, Boys? The Bronx Boys. And I, and I met, you know, I, I was married to his sister. And again, you know, once he found out who I was, you know, he became, you know, very, like, aware and cognizant of, you know, my contributions, right? So there was somebody out there talking stuff um, that wasn't, wasn't really accurate, and, and he you know, brought it to my attention. Um, so then that's when I decided to connect more with Mr. Wiggles. Because um, although I could get some information from Abby, he made it clear. And, and again, this is something that I didn't really know about, right? He made it clear that Wiggle, Mr. Wiggles was a big figure in, in this, you know, street style dance world. So, I, you know, I connected again with Mr. Wiggles. And um, that's when I found out that he was like one of the founding members of Rocksteady. Um, that's when I found out that this was global. I had no idea. He was the one who told me, I'm, I'm out in China, Japan, uh, all of Europe. I'm there nine months out of the year, you know, lecturing and teaching, you know, this culture, right. you know, teaching the dance. So, you know, Mr. Wiggles, you know, once I got a hold of who he actually was, I was like, this is what 
and by that time I, w I was you know mature I could see things I, mm -hmm. I had became a, a, a writer so I, I said this guy is a genius you know an urban genius and that's you know and then he, then he turned me on to you know crazy legs which at the time you know was his boy and you know he said crazy legs is the best b-boy of all time at least that's what he considered so I, I, I came I became part of this world Right. And I got embraced by these brothers. I got embraced by um, the, the greatest house dancers there is in, on the planet. Mm -hmm. You know, I, you know, I connected with Buddha Stretch. Buddha Stretch brought me out, you know, to an event and had me speak at, at an event. And I was like appreciative. And he says, dude, you know, I, I, I told him, thank you. You know, um, he said, dude, you got receipts. He said, everything you say makes sense. And he even said to me, he said, look, I, I go back, you know, I was a kid and I, and I knew about you guys. And when we came up with the dance house, you know, or, or when they came up with that dance house, I, I had said to him, there's already a name for that dance. It's called rock. Um, and that's because how close we are in terms of the movement, the steps, you know, the, the dance itself. Um, so I, I got connected with these guys and they brought me out into this world that I tra I've traveled. I've been to Japan. I've been to Italy, China to teach this dance that we call rock. Um, so I've been embraced by most of the community. Um, the up rock community, um, they've kind of rejected me because I bring a whole new flavor, right? I bring a sophisticated flavor. You know, I, I bring a very skilled flavor, you know, to this genre, you know, whereas, you know, a lot of the up rockers, you know, you know, I, I've tried to teach them and it's very difficult for them to get the steps, mm -hmm. right? Just like it is house. House is a very skillful dance that I love and that I can't get because you really have to commit. You have to be disciplined. The way I did rock is the only way I can get house right rock i you know i spent like months just watching these guys afraid to get on the floor but i would go home and practice right i would do their steps and i wouldn't do it the way they did it and i and i wasn't going to dance unless i did there was one day you know it was like four o'clock in the morning i woke up buzzing and i i got it and i got up and i did this step called um uh the uh the uh um, what is it the, the cypress groove right mm -hmm. and i did it perfectly but it took me a while right it took a lot of practice you know it, it's a discipline just like houses um so i think that's part of the reason why they you know i got rejected by the up rock community um and then and then you know what you don't know you know people reject what they don't know so you know, I'm bringing something really new to the table here, right? Into the mix, into the scene. Mm -hmm. um, and there's not many of us, you know. My partner is around, but he doesn't articulate it the way I can. He's still a great dancer. You know, Mike Dominguez and them, you know, they don't, they don't talk about it. They don't want to be, you know, in, in, you know, in front of people, you know, talking about this. You know, I took the responsibility to do it. So there's not many of us. So when there's just one of you, you know, they always, you know, like, he's lying, you know. Yeah, I got, I, this makes too much sense, right? I, well, you know, my information, you can't, you can't make this stuff up is what I'm saying. Right. So, you know, so slowly but surely I'm getting embraced, especially with this whole hip hop thing coming out that, you know, Puerto Ricans were not really, you know, in the beginning, wasn't there for the beginning. You know, we were. You know, as a matter of fact, you know, we were the beginning. I'm not saying, you know, we did the rap. We, I'm not, but I'm saying we were there, you know, you know, the, the, the mixing of the music, right? These guys got that later, right? So they claim Cool Herc through the first party of 73 and the first B-Boys danced to his song, you know, his songs, which were great songs, Just Begun, Give It Up and Turn It Loose, Get Into Something. That's cool. That's great. But we were doing that stuff four years earlier. Yeah. Um, so we were there, you know, so that's, so I'm, I'm, I, it, the embrace is changing. Right. Um, and I think, you know, I'm getting more than the benefit of the doubt.
So I, I still get challenged. Okay. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, it's an important piece. It's a small piece, right? But we go back to the beginning and everything comes from somewhere, right? right? Like I even said where we got it from, right? The groove that we, you know, that the black and brown community engaged in in the late 60s, right? Going home, this, man, I, I, I watched a video of, of uh, I think, I don't know what, I think the 50s, um, Palladium Mambo dancers. I was like, that's rock. Right. You know, but to different music, right. you know, a lot of their steps we did, but, it, you know, it looks different, but it's not. It's just to different music. So I've been able to put all this together because of guys like Mr. Wiggles, because of guys like Buddha Stretch. They've embraced me. They, they're the ones. I, I'm not arrogant enough. You know, I, I don't want to say, you know, you know, it came from what we did. You know, that's not on me. They said it. And when they said it, that gave me the license to say it. Um, and that's why, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm speaking out on this stuff. You know, I'm, you know, it, I, I do, I, I, I still teach, but I do more lecturing because they want to know the history. They want this information. They dig it. People around the world dig it. And who else have you been lecturing with on tour? Um, everywhere I go, if I go to Italy, you know, they, they first, they have me, they, they, they schedule a couple of dance classes, but they schedule a lecture, right? Um, and in Japan, the same thing, you know, they spent a whole night with me, just, you know, it was a lecture that turned into a, a Q&A, and that went forever. They want to know, and they, you know, just like, and that's why I, I, I like this interview. They wanted to know some personal, very personal things about me and about my generation. Right. I told them my father was murdered when I was 11. You know, I told them that. Um, uh, so when, when my father died, and I don't mean to, to regress, but when my oh, father died, please. my mother bugged out. You know, she sure. had a hard time. She had three boys and a, and a, and a little you know, baby girl. Um, so in order for her to keep her sanity, she went out and she partied and, and she would leave us with teenage girls from the neighborhood. They would babysit us. Now these teenage girls, what they would do when my mother went out, they changed the light bulbs in the house. We already had a system. They invited the guys and they partied in my house till two or three in the morning. Just when they thought my mother was coming, that's when they cleared out. But they were partying in my house. I was 11, 12 years old watching these guys dance, party, do whatever they did. So I had like an early, very early exposure to this stuff. So when I talk about that, they're like, I mean, especially overseas, they're really interested in, you know, in, in, in the story, right? Because it's, it comes from the heart. It comes from the soul. Right. And I think people love when you go soul to soul with them. I think that's really important. Um, so that's what I've been able to do, you know, in everything. Um, just um, a couple of months ago, I was at an event, a b-boy event, where they had a b-boy contest. And again, you know, we had a, uh, a panel discussion, and I was part of that um, when, when I did the thing at, in Washington. Um, you know, again, they asked me questions. They wanted to know how far back I went. So this is all interesting to people. They love hearing the history. Right, right. You, you spoke a lot about the music and the certain jams that called people, but... If you had to pick one jam, one record that called you to the dance floor, what would that be for you? Uh, well, or the top three? Yeah, let me go to top three because it took turns, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, you would dance to one song and that'd be your main song and then you get tired and bored of it and then you change. So it's a new day. It's definitely um, one of my favorites and, that, and I still get down to that. Um, just Begun was the song that sort of like propelled me and my partner to be on the top of that hierarchy of dancers. We created a routine to the whole song, mm -hmm. right? So at that time, they, you know, they would dance, they would do routines, um, stop, come back and do another one. We did one continuous routine for the whole song. Wow. So that was Just Begun. That's what got us to perform with the Latin Symbolics, right? That's when we started. We, we did colleges. We did, you know, we did again Barry Gordy Leviticus mm -hmm. you know um but so so it's a new day just begun and another one that I really liked was life and death by Abaco dreams 
Now that's the top three, but you know, next week you ask me, it might be a, you know a different top three. Got it, got it. You know, uh, Latin symbolics. Yes. Who are they? So the Latin symbolics might have been the very first like street style organized dance company. So they started. So another big part, in which what, what was pre you know pre hip hop pre house was the hustle. Right. That also came from the Puerto Rican community. All right. It wasn't it wasn't called the Latin, the hustle at that time. It was called the Latin hustle. I think they took the Latin part of it out now, but no, I'm sorry. It, it was so we were dancing rock. Right. Um, and then all of a sudden, I, I'd say as far back as 72, um, I seen people doing, you know, they were touching and dancing. Right. And they started and they were calling it. They called it the hustle. And then it became the Latin hustle. Right. And then it developed into something huge. It started very basic, but then it turned into, you know, where you had this footwork. It was a serious combination of rock and salsa done to, you know, uh, you know, disco music. I mean, that was that was it. Right. So um, so because rock was more underground and Rock was more challenging, right? So rock was not something that everybody did. The hustle became bigger than rock, right? So they they started getting requests. So and it was it was getting bigger. So George Vasconis, you know, may he rest in peace, a good man. You know, he he uh, he was a black belt in karate. He played basketball. He worked with young people all the time. He gave up his life for young people. So he put together this group called the Latin Symbolics, and it started out just hustle. It was him, um, Denise, they were partners, and then Eddie Ramonde was off the charts, and Sarah. Um, and then they brought in salsa dancers, right? George's brother, um, Michael, and then Pat. She was bald-headed. She was freaking amazing, right? And then, so they were already gigging, and then what happened was somebody told George about me and Enoch. And he came to a club one night. I, I think it might have been a club called the Abbey. Um, and he came and he saw us and he was all smiles. He said, you guys are great. He says, would you like to you know, dance and get paid for it? Would you like to be part of the Latin Symbolics? So he recorded us that night. We were like in heaven. You know, we were going back on the train. Again, you know, we're on our way to Hollywood. You know, what year was that's, that? That was 75. 75. Yeah, so I think it was the Abbey. It may have been the Duplex. There's so many clubs back in those days um, that we, you know, uh, frequented. Um, so, so we, you know, we did some stuff, man. We were we we danced at Cornell University, Wagner College, you know, the Barry Gordy thing, the Leviticus. Um, so they made their mark. They had already made their mark through the hustle. Right, because then the hustle spread, and, and there's other dance companies. Um, I forget uh, the uh, Dance Dimensions, which was Billy Fajardo, and 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 um, uh, damn, she's gonna kill me. Um, uh, they 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 were Sandra, Sandra and Billy. They were the best. They were they were doing. They had start. They had incorporated lifts. So they were like the modern day, you know, Ginger and Fred, you know, and they were made. And then other people started doing that. Then Floyd and Nelly, Eddie Vega, who was just what a talent, um, and Lube there. And then, you know, you had all these other companies. But Latin Symbolics was the original. Latin Symbolics was the first company. And, and we were probably, I mean, they were the company that, you know, that hired and brought us rock dancers in. Um, Again, you know, it started to fade, you know, early. Mm -hmm. um, Hustle kept going. Hustle died and then picked up again. Hustle is big still. Around the world, you know, again, Billy, Sa Billy Fahad was still doing this stuff. You know, we reconnected not too long ago. And the guy's doing amazing things. I mean, yeah. a another one who was really talented, really disciplined. That's the other part of this um, that I think is really important. Dance taught me how to be disciplined. It even taught me how to be intelligent. I was not good in school. You know, if, if they were, you know, back then they didn't test you for learning issues. If they would have tested me for learning issues back then, they would have found a whole load of them. 
I was more of a visual learner, mm -hmm. you know? So that's what dance, you know, I could, I could watch. Like I couldn't, like even now, if I take a class, I'll have a hard time getting steps. But if you just let me sit back and watch, I'll get it. Again, I'm a visual learner. The other thing it taught me was discipline. You know, we worked hard. We practiced. We practiced hours and hours. You know, I would never study for hours and hours. I would never do anything else for <laughs> hours and hours. You know, but dance I did. Billy Fajardo, what a disciplinarian he was. He was also a black belt of karate. Uh, and, and he, I mean, the way he practiced was second to none. You know, he was like the Michael Jordan of, of, of the Latin hustle in terms of, you know, how much work he put into it. So it, it helped us a lot. You know, it, it, it gave us, you know, a, you know, wisdom. It gave us intelligence um, and not just intellectual intelligence, emotional intelligence. Right. Because a lot of the people we know died, you know, whether it was the ways, drug addiction, get shot, you know, go to jail for life. That's, that's, that's where we grew up and, and we were able, you know, to, you know, get past that, right? And, it, it, you know, and it gave, and the dance gave us enough time to connect to something else bigger and better, you know, whether it was a job, a college, or whatever we decided to do with our careers. Here I am, you know, I'm still dancing, you know, I, I just wrote a movie, you know, so it, it, it gave me the opportunity, right? Billy Fahadu. You know, he's still dancing now as much as he danced when we were kids, you know, and there's a lot of other people, you know, again, you know, I, I call us um, urban royalty, you know, and then we are urban geniuses, I think. Got it, got it. Any other Latin Symbolics members you haven't mentioned that you'd love to give credit to? Yeah, well, so we were the original members, you know, so there was, there was six and then me and Enoch, when we came on, we were the original eight, right? Um, we kind of like separated because we didn't get enough work, right? So, you know, a lot of us went separate ways. So George Vasconi's though, he stuck, he stuck with the Latin symbolics and he opened it up and he brought other people in. And I, I was already gone, so I don't know who those people were, but he made it a bigger dance company. And it went that way for quite a while until I think he got into promoting, I think, um, Judy Torres was one of his singers, um, so the dance got him into you know something else. But but the Latin Symbolics blew up, you know, and they became a much bigger dance company, much bigger dance company with a lot of great dancers, mostly hustle dancers. Yeah, Judy Torres, wow. Yeah, you know, like first lady of freestyle. Freestyle, yeah, that's you know? yeah. Talk that's to us about one. freestyle music and how did that mix into well for us rock dances and that rock culture you know so after you know after that music you know when it became mainstream it kind of died for us because it didn't have that same soulful feeling and i'm not just talking about like the b-boy anthems those the songs that we 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 um we, we competed to um i'm also talking about like these softer songs you know oc smith la la p song um barbara ackland you know i'll bake me a man um, Running Back and Forth by Edwin Starr, um, Don't Bring Back the Memories by The Four Tops. There was a lot of songs thrown out, out of my mind by the sidelights. Um, so once that started to change, we were sort of like, again, we were turned off. And that's when a lot of people left. I stood because what came after pretty quick was freestyle. And freestyle I could connect to. That became my choice of music. So whenever I went out, like there was um, in the 80s, there was a club in the Bronx called PCs on Westchester Avenue. Across the street, there was Peoples and then Riddlers. You know, there was a whole bunch, you know, of, of you know, clubs that played freestyle music. And that's what I started frequenting. Not as, and nobody ever knew who, you know, I mean, I just went to hang. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed it, right? So, but that music reminded me of, the music that we had, you know, you know, all go to music in the in the early to mid seventies. So the connection to freestyle for me was, was there until I heard house. House is the the, the, the music that I connect to most now, um, because of again, 
even freestyle, you know, there's something about it that gets inside your soul, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing with house. That gets into my soul, you know. Hip hop, yeah, but certain hip hop songs. Sure. Any house song, any, you know, the freestyle artists, they were pretty awesome. Right. Right. That's that's great. So you're obviously passionate about the rock dance. What's in the future for the rock dance and your workshops? Where, where, where are you going to? Huh. Where well, are you taking this to? Yeah, so I, I think that, again, it's a, it's, a, it's a small piece, but it's an important piece. It's also a missing piece, right? Missing pieces are always intriguing, right? When you find them and you can make sense of them. So for me, it's... it's for me, myself, it's more about telling this story, right? Because this is a Latino story. It's a Puerto Rican story, man. You know, we don't get our stories told, you know? Right. Um, and, and I'm not blaming anybody. I think it's upon, it's, it's upon us, Boricuas, to tell our own stories. Right. And so that's what I'm doing now, you know? That's what this is to me. However, I got students all over the world who are promoting and teaching rock. And they're not only dancing rock to the old music, right? They, they came up with something called new wave rock. So they dancing it to all genres now. Probably not house, but hip hop. You know, I've seen, you know, my boy Shido from Japan dance to hip hop, Afro house, you know, the whole Afro element. Man, he does some steps to it. So, and there's, there's Antonello in Italy, um, Suimos in, in Czech. So, it's happening. I've, I, so even even here um, in the summers, uh, Dance Fusion, right? Um, Mop Top University, who the stretches, you know, people, they do mm -hmm. workshops, right? They do like two week long workshops. And I'm a part of that. So people come out from all over the world and they take my class. Um, so I teach the class. I lecture a little bit. He, he, mm -hmm. he says, your, your dancing will take care of the history. He said, I just want you to dance, teach them the steps teach them the moves um, because they, they're connected, right? So I went one time, I did a workshop for this company called KR3TS, right? It's a young company ran by Violeta Galazza. She's doing great work with them. Um, so she had me do a workshop with them, right? And it was, you know, a rock, you know, this is an old timer, a, a, a triple OG. He's going to tell you what they did back in the day. So as I'm showing them steps, this little girl, she had to be like 12 years old, raised her hand and said, yo, man, that's hip hop. I said, no, my mom, we were doing this in 72. And they were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, the same thing with house. You know, so when I do a workshop with, with, um, with, with, with Buddha Stretch, we all, he always connects me with, an, uh, uh, you know, one of the newer genres like house, right? I've done workshops with Egypt. You know, I've done workshops with Capella from, from Paris. You know, whereas I do rock steps and he turns them into house steps, you know, right there on the spot. You know, um, Link is one of the greatest hip hop dancers ever. I mean, this guy goes way back and he's still throwing down. So Link, you know, me and him, we've done, you know, workshops together. Rockefeller, one of the best B-girls ever, you know. I do rock and then she connects it to breaking. You know, we did that with Samuel. Um, I did rock, he connected it to top rock. So that's the kind of stuff I still do, I still do now. And um, I enjoy it. Um, again, I'm trying to get into something a little bit bigger. I, you know, I want to tell, I want to keep telling the Latino story, the Puerto Rican story in a, in, in sort of like a bigger medium, right? Or, you know, I'm, mm -hmm. that's why I'm, you know, I'm writing film. You know, I have a film that's been picked up that might be green lit within the next year or so. I hope we're on the set soon. All right. um, and it's a it's a it's a dynamic story about the Latino community, you know, and, and it's all Latinos. Right. And in this in this story, I have Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, Cubans, um, Guatemalans, Mexico. I mean, it's all 21 ethnicities. Right. Because I believe like we all have we all have our individual ethnicity. Right. We have our diaspora. We have our culture and we have our humanity. Right. Um, but together. We're a powerful bunch, you know, in more than one way. So that's what I, I'm doing now, and that's what I, that's the work I want to do. The other thing I want to stay connected to is the community, right? So, you know, with my experience, what I've been through, right? So we're talking about the rock part of it. There's the personal part of it, 
right? There's that part of the struggle that, you know, I've been able to go into institutions and talk to young people about this and reach them and inspire them. So that's something that I want to continue to do. No matter what I do, I want to come back and share, you know, my story, you know, what I went through with kids who need to hear it. Mm -hmm. Right? They need to hear it from us, you know, who survived, you know, and not just surviving, they're thriving. You know, I believe I'm thriving. There's many of us who are thriving, but we need to go back to our communities, to our kids, you know, who are struggling, you know, and who need to hear from us. So those are the things I want to do moving forward. Wow. The dance, I like, you know, I'll stay dancing, you know, it keeps me in shape, but, you know... <laughs> I don't know how much time I, I still have because I, I go off, you know, I'll, I'll drop, I'll go down. You know, that's the whole thing with rock. You know, a big part of rock was going down, you know, not staying on the floor and doing floor moves, but going down, you know, go right. down, go down. That was part of our steps and you need strong knees for that. Right, right. Oh, this is, this is great, great information. Is there anything that you'd like to cover that, that I haven't addressed? Um... Wow, we've addressed a lot, so it'd be hard for me to be, you know, for me to um, figure out what we haven't addressed. I, I think that um, you know, it's just important for us to support each other, right? Um, we got to keep our ego out of stuff, right? So. Um, if, if, if there's anything I think that we don't say enough is that um, we need to give the, each other the benefit of the doubt. It's, it's, it's so easy to be negative. I mean, that's, it takes work to be positive, even with yourself. You know, you gotta wake up in the morning and say, I'm gonna have a great day. I'm a... Negativity, <laughs> you don't have to do nothing. It just comes in, it just pops in. You know, you could be walking along, minding your own business, then you get intruded by a crazy thought, you know? Um, so I think that, yeah, man, we, you know, our emotional um, and spiritual well-being, you know, is what's going to, you know, propel us into being a powerful force. We're already a powerful force, but now we got to start doing powerful things so people, you know, on, in, you know, the, the bigger community can see how powerful we really are. Wow, awesome. And we like to end all of our oral histories with one question. What does the Bronx mean to you? Uh, wow, well, you know, so there's, there's, you know, I, I got to be honest, right? So there's a lot of mixed feelings, right? Good, bad, and indifferent, you know? Um, you know, um, the people I love most, you know, I connected to in the Bronx. You know, I drive my car sometimes, and I remember, you know, some of the friends from back in the day, you know, um, you know, my, I had a lot of friends from the black community that I'm not connected to anymore, that I don't see, you know? Pete Jimenez, Ray Smith, Claude, Claude Butler. I think about these guys and I tear up. You know, I tear up thinking about them, you know? Um, and that's, to me, you know, if you ask me, you know, what I've been in search of all my life, right? It's been connection. You know, connecting, going soul to soul. You know, I can say, you know, these guys you know, were there for part of my life, but they they're in my memory. You know, and and you know, I have love for them. So that means if I have love for them, then my body, my mind is feeling love, right? So, and then and then you know, just my boys growing up. You know, we we had this this bond, right? We didn't want to separate. You know, we go from the club, they go home, change, and come back to my house. Or I go back to that. We couldn't be apart from each other. You know, but at the same time, those brothers are not around anymore. They were killed. So, you know, you talk about mixed, you know, mixed feelings. You know, um, some of them went to jail. Um, you know, you know, the, the, you know, the good with the bad, with the indifferent, you know. Um, but the truth is, you know, with everything I've gone through, I wouldn't change, I'd be afraid to change anything because that means it would change who I am today and I'm good with who I am today. So in this all, you know, I, I was born, raised, and I still live in the Bronx. Everything I got was here, based here. My foundation is from the Bronx. And that foundation has proven to be extremely powerful. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't change a thing. 
Awesome, awesome. Frank Papo Rojas, rock dancer extraordinaire. Thank you so much. Peace. Pastor Crespo, I'm honored, bro, and I'm glad we connected. Thank you. Thank you so much.